I greet you, dear concerned friends, in many places here in South Africa and uh, numbers of you overseas. I've been asked to share my thoughts regarding the current serious situation in South Africa and especially here in KwaZulu-Natal where we are and I'm speaking to you, Michael Cassidy, now talking to you from my home. It's very difficult to know actually what to say because the situation is very complex and I don't profess 2020 vision on it. Um, and it's, it's certainly much more complex <laughs> than just uh, some kind of convulsive upheaval because a particular politician has been sent, and rightly so, to prison for defying the rule of law. But I think there are, there are three things that I, I, I want to say that I think we need to do. The first is we need to understand the situation. The second is we need to pray. And the third is we need to speak to power. And I'd say we need to seek prayerfully to understand the situation. In the Old Testament, in the book of Chronicles, 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, it talks about the men of Issachar, it said, who had understanding of the times and who knew what Israel ought to do. Dear friends, we all need to try and get an understanding of the times, generally and here in South Africa at this time, particularly of a situation uh, where the country is convulsed, shocked, stunned um, and very uh, un unclear about the way ahead. A lot of hopelessness and a lot of despair and bewilderment. You know, what do we do? Where do we go? How do we, how do we think? Um, there's also fear. Fear for their own lives, other people's lives, loved ones, and so on and so forth. So, I think we have to ask ourselves, how did this happen? <laughs> how did it come to pass? And many have very strong and dogmatic theories uh, about the causes and the ingredients. And my own conclusion after hearing many of these is there's a bit of truth in almost all of them. But we do have a tinderbox that for a long time has been brewing. Uh, a sort of ticking time bomb, you might say. So what is in the mix of all of this? I think, first of all, there is a sense of the hangover of apartheid uh, and the injustices and the wounds of that time. That is undoubtedly there. Then there is unemployment, job losses. The job loss thing is absolutely huge, I think in this, of people suddenly having a chance to get things they didn't have before and they're out of, they're out, they're out of work. Poverty, inequality. One person said it's not about race, it's only about inequality. Well, I do think it's partly about inequality. Uh, that's definitely there. There's a sense of a teetering economy because of corruption, uh, because leaders have had their hands at the till, because of state capture, the collapse of our state-owned enterprises like ESCOM, the electricity supply, SAA, the airways, uh, the South African railways, and so on. So that is there. Then there is anger over petty crime, and the petty crime, of course, leads to major crime. We are a very crime-filled country. Then I think, and this is very important and not to be missed, there are very serious rivalries within the ANC, the African National Congress governing party. And I do believe that our president is being undermined uh, and white anted and things are being made very difficult for him to, uh, to move and to lead with a kind of strength that, uh, that, that he needs. Um, and I think that there are some masterminds behind all of this instigating and helping to control and uh, uh, stimulate the violence. Some say these may, be, may, may come from uh, 
uh, disenchanted veterans of the old Mkonto Wazizwi, uh, the, the armed arm of the wing of the ANC. Uh, so all of this is playing in, and there's, a, there's an attempt almost to, I think, to unseat the present government or present president. We may be watching, actually, a, a failed coup um, in, in, in front of us. Um, then there is undoubtedly opportunistic criminality. Um, yes, some little people are doing criminal things, but big people too. And so you have televisions being carted out from shops and put in BMWs and people drive off. So all of this constitutes the tinderbox, and it only was really needing a spark uh, to ignite it. And that, that spark came with the proper arrest appropriate arrest of uh, President Zuma for breaking the law. Um, none of his supporters could believe it was happening. He couldn't believe himself it was happening. Uh, and many of them don't understand factors re actually relating to the rule of law and constitutional issue. So he's seen as a martyr, unjustly imprisoned and needing to be released. So ongoing and prayerful seeking to understand the situation, to understand the times and find out what to do. Then secondly, I believe we need to turn to God in earnest prayer. The all-powerful God and prayer is the key. Even as we're seeking to understand the situation, prayer must be central in there as well. Tennyson once said, more things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. And I, I think that's very true. And of course, we all know the very famous, well-worn verse of uh, 2 Chronicles seven fourteen: If my people who are called by my name uh, humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven, forgive the sin and heal the land. That great promise from 2 Chronicles 7.14, we need to hold on to very, very tight. We need to understand, therefore, our need for repentance. And, and all of us, including us, because we're very guilty for the ongoing consequences of apartheid uh, that are also playing out now. And praying, we need to understand that we're in a spiritual war. Paul says in Ephesians 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against thrones, principalities, and powers, and the forces of spiritual wickedness in high places. And if we're in a war, we need to undertake spiritual warfare. And that is something we can do. And uh, uh, Paul, Paul uh, says in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's not just a battle against people. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against thrones, principalities, and powers, and the forces of wickedness in high places. And, and as we use those prayerful weapons, we can pull down the strongholds which keep people believing wrongly and therefore acting wrongly. Paul says, out of the spiritual warfare, thoughts, all thoughts can become captive to Christ. I very, very strongly believe that. So all the prayer networks that are being activated here, no doubt others overseas, please, these need to keep going deeply and strongly with prayer as a prior priority. I think that prayer needs to be also very strongly uh, there for the powers that be. Paul says to Timothy that first of all, prayers and intercessions need, need to be made for all those who are in authority so that we may be able to live peaceable lives. So the prayer for Saul Ramaphosa and his key leadership is very, very important in this. And we unleash the super and supernatural power of God into the situation. And our Lord Jesus himself said, all power in heaven and on earth is committed to me. And so he can do the most awesome things uh, at this time to rescue us. So there is that place of prayer. 
central place. And then I believe, thirdly, we need to speak to power. We need to speak to the state. Romans 13.4 says that the leader, leaders are God's servants for the good of all. So we say to the state, do you realize you are God's servants for the good of all? You have a transcendent accountability to God. Individual leaders and the state as a whole, uh, you are not autonomous. You're not a law unto yourself. You have transcendent accountability to the living God because you are servants of that living God. And he is the one who sends you. He is the one who, who gives you your instructions and orders. And you are working for the good of everybody. Apartheid, what happened was that we were, there were laws and, and, and all of that that were there for the good of whites and not for the good of blacks. Uh, that's, that's a recipe for disaster. So we, we, need to, we, need to, we need to remind leaders that they are there and that they are to lead, uh, and, but it's a humble leadership with accountability to God. And then we need to also to say to those in power, listen, you have power. Now exercise it. In Romans 13, 4, Paul says, uh, if you, the citizens, do wrong, you must be afraid because he, the leader or the state, does not bear the sword in vain. And he said, the servant of God, verse 4, the leader, is there to exercise the wrath of God, is a servant of God to exercise wrath on wrongdoing. So leaders and the state needs to bring to bear sufficient power and force Without killing, we must absolutely avoid deaths because once you have bloodshed, then then you see you have martyrs and the thing changes gear to something else much more serious. But the full power of state, we need many more than 25,000 troops, probably 50 or 60,000. But if you, you have such people professionally able to deal with crowds, water cannons, tear gas, and so on and so forth, you can quell, uh, you can quell what is going on on and bring it to order and into peace. So, dear friends, I just want to say, I believe that we need to seek prayerfully to understand the situation we are in. Then we need to pray deeply and sincerely and powerfully to our Lord who answers prayer. And then we need to speak to the state saying, you are servants of the living God, you must act like that but you must exercise your power, the full power of the state, to bring this under control. So God bless you and all of us in this land and beyond concerned about the situation. Au revoir for now.